Welcome to our online service with Pastor George Mulinge coming to you from Deliverance Church Mount Zion Worship Center. Our calling is to submit to God. And when we submit to God, God will deal with our enemies. Hallelujah. Our church where ordinary people are empowered to win souls for Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 A church where ordinary people are transformed and equipped to become kingdom focused believers. The greatest problem is obedience to the word of God. As in the time, God moved them from Egypt so that he can take them to Canaan. But we see what our work went up to Canaan because of their disobedience. Hebrews 6 1 admonishes us to move on to maturity in knowing God and entreats us to live the elementary principles of our faith. Our salvation is a journey of faith that requires continued growth from the milk, meat, and the strong meat levels of the word. I therefore invite you to stay tuned and receive the rightly divided word of God as taught by Pastor George. Oh, hallelujah. Welcome to our broadcast, our service once again, this wonderful day that God has given unto us. I know to some of you it's early in the morning, to others you're just in the wee hours of the night, others you're just seated somewhere on dinner with your family, and in whatever time that you may be tuning in, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you in our service today. Once again, this is your friend and Pastor George Mulinge coming to you all the way from Mount Zion Worship Center in Nyali, Mombasa, Kenya. It is always a joy that I can be able to come to you right in your home or in your car where you're driving or in your office with the Word of God. And as I have always said, the scripture says, man shall not live by bread alone, that is by food alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. I would like to invite you today to pick up with me where we left last Sunday on the series that we've been carrying on, on understanding the Great Tribulation. This is one of the portions of scripture in the Bible that it's not properly taught within the church. And if God has put it, us with it in the Bible, why not walk in understanding? Why not, you know, get the light of it and be uh, very sure of what Jesus talked about it? And therefore today I'd like us to go into the third part in continuing with this uh, great lesson on understanding the great tribulation. Please, let's pray together. Father, we thank you this wonderful morning. We thank you that this is the day that God you have made for us to rejoice and be glad in it. And as we now begin to delve into your word, Father, we pray, open your word to us. Let the curtains that in the, the, level, the revealed word, the revelation of your word, Lord, let them be pulled down. Father, we thank you that we are in for a great time in your presence. For your word tells us that in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. May your word today move us to, from a place of immaturity to maturity in the knowledge of you. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And therefore, I just want to go straight to what we started talking about. Now, the event in view or the event in discussion, the great tribulation, this is what is actually known as uh, apoclaxy of the Bible or the last things or the events that, that will happen after the resurrection rapture of the church when the church has been removed from the face of the earth. And we're looking forward to a time after the church has disappeared because it will be the disappearance of the church will be such a sudden event that will happen in the twinkling of an eye. And people will be looking around to see or to, to look at friends and people that they knew and people that they have interacted with, people they have done business with, only to find them missing because they have been raptured, they have been removed from the earth. And the question has been, once the church has been removed from the earth, then what next? What happens to the people that remained on earth? And they were never taken up. They were never, you know, they were never taken to be, to meet Christ in the air. Absolutely, there will be people here on earth that will remain. And those people can only be clearly understood by looking at scriptures, what we've been looking at. And I want to draw our attention 
to some words to this banner you see here to explain a few things. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 24, and I want to be looking at verse number 21, 22. What Jesus talked about this event that we're talking about. It says, for then shall be great tribulation. Such was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Now, uh, no, now shall it ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should, uh, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Let's look at that scripture very carefully. It says something. It says that this event in view, that is the great tribulation, at the time of its happening, it will be such an amazing event, such as it is, there's no such a thing that has ever happened in the world before. Hallelujah. And it says, unless those days be shortened, no flesh shall be saved. Now, since from the beginning, when the scripture is talking about beginning, we are looking at a time period when God started dealing with man. And we understand in Genesis 1.1, the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. When we're talking of God creating the heavens and the earth, we are looking at a time when the first man was created and put uh, in the face of the earth by God. But in the times before man's creation, we're looking at a time which we call the endless ages of eternity past. Eternity past. There could be millions or thousands of hundreds of years before Adam was created. And what we're talking about is a time past. At that time past, when God thought of putting together the heavens and the earth. So when the heavens and the earth were finished and everything, later God created man in his own image and in his own likeness. And man, according to the Chronicles of History, is very instrumental in documenting time. So from the time Adam was created, all the way to when the Son of God comes back, uh, comes back on earth, and when that great day, the white throne judgment, the last day, I mean the final day, when that happens, that is given to our understanding. In other words, the scriptures has opened us matters between those two points, between the time of Adam and between the end of everything. That is given to us. It is in scriptures. Jesus talked about it. The prophets prophesied about it. It is in your Bible. And God expects us that we go through the scriptures and get a clear understanding of what God talks concerning matters that are to happen. Hallelujah. And that's really very, very important. The Bible tells us in Desire chapter number 46, verse number 9 and 10, and I'm just paraphrasing in this, that God declares the end from the beginning. He declares the end, that is the end. He declares this end from this beginning. In other words, before the end. God has already declared it. God has already predetermined it. God has already organized it. God has a plan on how matters will begin and how they will move from that point all the way to the end. And what Jesus was talking about was in reference of that which is to happen in the time that focuses on that last times of man's creation. And therefore, looking at this verse again, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, verse number 21, such as was not, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. To this time is when? To that time when Christ is talking about the things that are here to happen. Now, I would like to walk you through a few things so that we can pick up from where we are talking about. There are three dispensations that are important in man's life. The first one is a time when God dealt with man 
in general. That is from the time Adam was created all the way to the time when God called Abraham from the whole of the Chaldean in Genesis chapter number 12. That is one dispensation, a period of 2,000 years when God dealt with man on earth in general. And then after dealing with man in general, the second generation, God called out a man known as Abraham from the whole of the Chaldean, and he told him to leave his country and leave his everything and go to a place where he would show him for an inheritance. And there are promises that God gave that man if he obeyed the Lord. Hallelujah. And I would like us to mark on something that God has been seeking man's obedience from the time he was created. From, God, from the time God created Adam and put him in the garden, God has been seeking for faithful obedience from man's part on that which he has said. The first words being, when God put the first Adam in the Garden of Eden with his wife, God gave them a command to eat from every tree in the garden that God had provided. And every other tree, they were forbidden of partaking of it. Because the day that they would do so, God had warned that they will actually die. Now, did man obey? No. Man never obeyed God's command. And by disobedience, from that time, God has been working on getting man obey his voice faithfully. To the time of Abraham, we find Abraham being a man that obeyed God's voice. And upon obeying God's voice, we see something that is attributed to him, a promise that has to do with a future inheritance, with a future blessing, with a realization, an inheritance. And that, that was marked because a man obeyed God. Taught in church every day, we hear the voice of God every day. But the question is, how do you obey the word of God? How have you given yourself to living in accordance to that which you read from the word of God, to that which you hear, to that which you have been taught? That's a question that you and me needs to answer. And therefore, God was seeking for faithful obedience in the first dispensation. In the second dispensation, having called Abram from the whole of the Chaldean, all what he was seeking again is faithful obedience. You remember after talking to Abraham, then through Abraham, Isaac is born. And through Isaac, Jacob is born. And through Isaac, the nation of Israel is born. And throughout this dispensation from the time of Abraham's obedience up to the time of Christ's first coming, God is dealing with the people of Israel alone and not the Gentile nations, not man in general, as God did in the first dispensation. It was only, and the scripture was only focusing on the nation of Israel. Very, very important for us to understand. And therefore, in as much as God dealt with the nation and pleaded with them to walk in faithful obedience in that which he has said, the people of Israel did not did not obey God. In fact, they went in cycles. They would obey God and again drag into disobedience. They would walk in obedience and again drag, drag into disobedience. Finally, something happened in the end. Before the end of the, first, the second dispensation, and you will notice something. The first dispensation took about 2,000 years. And toward the end of the 2,000 years, Something happened to the nation of Israel. The nation walked in total disobedience to that which God had said. As a matter of fact, that, entered, that disobedience entered into a climax to the point that God had actually sent Christ Jesus to come as their Messiah. And as he came as their Messiah, the work of the Messiah was to restore the nation back to God so that the promises covenanted between their forefather, that, that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that would become a reality. And you will remember God had said, if you will be obedient to my voice, you shall be unto me a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, and God would lift them above all nations of the earth. That was the word of the Lord. 
Hallelujah. God had promised that if they would be obedient, he would place them in a land. And the land was to be flowing with milk and honey. The land was to be a place of abundance, a place in accordance to God's promise, a place where there would be no suffering, a place that God had promised. Hallelujah. But what happened? Because of Israelites' disobedience, they entered into the land, continued with their disobedience, and finally enemies uprooted them from their land. They drove them away from their land. And finally they found themselves in Babylon, in the captivity of Babylon, because of the enemy infiltrating and chasing them out of their land and having no settling in that which God had put them to settle. And what happens? The people of God cry, as usual. They keep on crying to God, crying to God, crying to God. Now, when we begin to talk about the Great Tribulation, we now focus on the nation of Israel. Remember, we said something in our previous teaching. We said uh, when we have been handling rapture and beyond, and I would like to invite our viewers to go to the YouTube, subscribe to George Mulinga Ministries. You will find a series of teachings on rapture and beyond, and you will realize what will have been happening from the time of Christ's first coming all the way to that time when the church is removed from the earth. And when the church is removed to the earth, what happens? That's what we have covered in the rapture and beyond. But let me come back to what we've been talking about so that I don't confuse you. We've been looking at the nation of Israel. And the point of the climax, like we have highlighted before, according to Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 24, we see the rejection of the Messiah. And once they reject the Messiah, God put them aside. Let me explain that a little bit. When the nation kept on sliding into disobedience, and God's calendar was still moving on, when the fullness of time came, God sent His Son, Jesus. And the sending of His Son, Jesus, was the purpose of restoring the nation from its continued disobedience to a place of obedience. But when Christ, when God sent Jesus Christ, what happened? The people did not receive Him, neither did they receive His message. So they rejected him. You remember the story in the book of Matthew chapter number 12. When he walked in the tabernacle building and he found a man that had been paralyzed and he performs a miracle that day and upon that miracle performed, the, the leaders of the people, the Pharisees and those who were in charge of the tabernacle, they attributed that which Jesus did that day by healing a man that was paralyzed as the work of Belzebub or as the work of the devil. And because of that rejection, Jesus had no otherwise than to just walk out of the house. And what you'll find in Matthew chapter number 12 is that Jesus walks out of Israel and stands by the seaside in Matthew chapter number 13 verse number 1 and begins to speak to the Gentiles in parables. So in other words, Christ comes for the nation of Israel to restore them back to God. So that that which had been promised through an obedient man would be fulfilled at Christ's coming. But what do they do? They reject him. And after that rejection, then Jesus Christ walks, aw uh, walks away. In fact, they did not only reject him, but they ended up actually putting him on the cross. They ended up crucifying him on the cross. Because of the, that rejection and that which was in their hearts. And because of you know, uh, uh, crucifying Christ Jesus, then God had no otherwise. Then a door opened into another generation. The nation is now set aside because of rejecting the Messiah. And now the nation is set aside, and God is no longer dealing with the nation of Israel. From the time Christ came, the Gentiles received the word of God, and the Gentiles begin to, to, to get saved and walk in obedience. And this has been the time, from the time of Christ's first coming up to today, it has been God dealing with the church. 
Hallelujah. God has been dealing with the church. And I wanted you to see a picture of those three dispensations. The first dispensation, God dealing with the man in general. And then the second dispensation, God dealing with the nation of Israel alone. And then in the third dispensation, God deals with the church alone. That understanding is critical. Now, at the nation of Israel received Jesus Christ the Messiah. And they agreed and not crucified him. That which had been covenanted between God and their forefathers would have been fulfilled at Christ's coming. But because they did not, the business was not finished. It wasn't finished. That business of that Jesus wanted to do for the nation was not finished. Now, this is where now we connect to the prophecies and that which is talked in the scriptures concerning Jesus Christ and the same thing that Jesus talked about the restoration of the nation of Israel. And we began by reading and saying in Matthew chapter number 24 that that time of the future of the nation of Israel, it is so terrible, it's so serious, it's a terrific point of event because the nation must go through a period of punishment of what they did to the Messiah. Their rejection to the Messiah, will have, they will have to pay for because they didn't receive that which God gave them. And therefore, in a time yet future, Jesus spoke about it, what will happen to the Jewish people in Matthew 24, following their rejection of what God had said. And these things concerning the nation of Israel were opened through prophecies and through men of God in the Old Testament. And some of the people that opened or got this, what would be happening to the nation of Israel, one of them was Daniel. And we've been talking about Daniel 70 weeks. Daniel, during the time that... I want to remind you again. <laughs> I want to remind you again. Because they say that learning is a process of repetition. If you go back again, you bring people back to a refreshment of what they needed to know. We said, because of the people's continuous re sin and rebellion, God allowed enemies to infiltrate their land. And by the enemies of infiltrating their land, the nation, the people of Israel, now got uprooted from the land of promise, from the house of bread, from Bethlehem, from the place that God had talked to them. But because of disobedience, they would not settle, they would not enjoy the good of the land. Their enemies drove them out, and they ended up in captivity in Babylon for a period of 70 years. Praise the name of Jesus. And in that particular period of time, this is covered in our first and second session in understanding the great tribulation. We have covered Daniel 70 weeks. In this, you will realize that the nation finds itself in a place of captivity, serving others and desiring to go back to the land. In fact, the nation was not only uprooted from the land, the nation was completely driven out, out away, including the place of worship, the temple, and the city of Jerusalem. They were all brought into ruins by their enemies. And therefore, Israel in the land of captivity desired to go back to their land. And by desiring to go back to their land in remembering what God had actually talked to their fathers, to, their, to Abraham, they begin to cry out to God. And I have talked to you in the previous part that Daniel found himself as a young Jewish man in Babylon captivity. And towards the end of the 70 years that God had said they would be in captivity, Daniel started praying to God. Hallelujah. And the amazing thing that we discovered is that Daniel as a young man had not known the history. He did not know what had happening, happened in the years and what God had. He only, according to Daniel chapter number 9 verse number 2, as he was searching through the books, as he was going through the books, he discovered what God had spoken concerning the nation of Israel. And he discovered that while they are in a foreign land, 
for a period of 70 years. They will humble themselves and they will pray. They will repent of their sins and God will hear of their prayer and God will make a restoration. So the time when Daniel was praying, it was actually towards the end of the 70 years. And therefore, Daniel discovers it's just about time. And he goes to prayer deeply and seek the Lord and, you know, weeps and, oh my God. And it was like it's now or never. And I thank God because there's still power in the place of prayer. Let me repeat that again. There's still power today in the place of prayer. God still hears prayer. Daniel carried the burden of his people. By reading through the history and seeing how the people have disobeyed God. Seeing how the people would have been uh, enjoying peace in their land. And seeing that these people are in a place of captivity totally because of disobedience. And Daniel talked to God and he prayed with passion and compassion. And God had prayer. And we realize that upon hearing that prayer, an angel was released to bring an answer. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. We covered that, how the angel of the Lord came and interpreted the vision and the dream of Daniel. And he gave them six points of what will happen to the nation according to what God had already predetermined. He told Daniel that six things will happen even as you have prayed. Hallelujah. And these are the six things that we discovered. We discovered Daniel was told, number one, that God has ordained that there will be 70 weeks that God has set aside to be able to restore the nation by finishing transgression. Number two, by making an end of sins. Number three, and make a reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in an everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal a prophecy and vision. And number six, to anoint the most high. So Daniel is praying, and this vision comes clear. It comes clear that it's about time that the restoration. Now, let me go back again. When Daniel is doing, is, is praying, is somewhere around here. Somewhere around here. 583 BC. That's when, before Jesus Christ was born. You know, when you count BCs and ADs, anything that happened before Christ was born is called BC, before Christ. And numbers are worked backwards. So these are 583 years before Christ was born. And AD is years after Christ was born. So Daniel is receiving the prophecy and vision some 583 years before Jesus was crucified or before Jesus came. And he was told that your people have been in these problems and now their problem is coming to an end. Actually, it's only 70 weeks. By in 70 weeks, God will restore the people. Now, we interpreted the 70 weeks and we realized the language used in scripture is not only 70 weeks, but it's actually 70 sevens. That marks 490 years that the people would be restored. Hallelujah. I don't want to go back because that is in the video. You need, just need to go back. And when we looked at the scriptures in our second video, we understood that that which had been given to Daniel from the edict that was given by King Cyrus from the time of that uh, edict or going forth of the command, about 483 years of that fulfillment happened. But at the, at the, toward that time of finishing, then they killed Jesus Christ before he finished his business. Hallelujah. 483, they killed the Messiah. So seven years were left unfulfilled to, as God had said through Daniel. And when you begin to look at those seven years, that was supposed to be fulfilled so that the nation of Israel would be restored, you will find the gap of the sequence of 2,000 years. So 7,000 years are missing. And once God has dealt with the church, and the church has been removed from the face of the earth. 
There will be seven years of the great tribulation. Hallelujah. Seven years of great tribulation. And these seven years will be a period of time when God will be dealing with the nations, with the nation of Israel. And he is dealing with them when the church has been removed from the earth and the people that live on earth. So let's understand that the nation of God's dealing with the nation of Israel is not done when church is present on earth. The church will have been gone. And God now begins to deal so that what was prophesied through Daniel can be finalized. And as I come to the end of this, I want to, to say something in accordance to what we saw in, in, in Matthew chapter number 24. When Jesus talked about what will happen during that time. And the Bible tells us that time of the great tribulation, like Jesus said it, it will be a unique period of time like none other that has never happened since the beginning of the world. For there shall be great tribulation, verse number 21, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Now ever shall be, and except those days be shortened, unless the seven years be shortened, then the Bible says, then it will be, there will be no flesh saved. But for the elect sect, that is for the nation of Israel, God will have them shortened. Now, I want us to wind up this for today. Why would God allow a people that he loved? Why would God allow the nation of Israel, when the church has been removed here, to begin, you know, uh, uh, going through difficult times? And what about the Gentile people that will not have been saved? You know, our God, the Bible says that the foundations of his throne are justice, are righteousness and justice. And once God says a word concerning a thing, God is committed to restoring and to confirming that which he has said. The scripture tells us in the book of Numbers 23, 19, that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he a son of man that he will repent of what he has said. When God promises, God sees to it that he will actually have to fulfill the promise. When God says, this must be done, it must be done, because it's the words of the Lord. And when you look at the dealings with the nation of Israel, God had pleaded with them, including sending them prophets, including sending them Jesus, but they would not listen. The reason why they are to be punished is not because, I mean, it's simply because they didn't listen to the voice of the Lord. And by so doing, God has allowed a time yet future that he will bring them to a place where they must obey the voice of God. And a good example is that of Joseph in the Old Testament. The people of Israel had no alternative than to go back to Joseph in Egypt where he had ruled as prime minister. And God meant them, all of them kneel before Joseph who they rejected. And they bowed before Joseph because God had brought them to a point where they would not do anything than to only plead to him that they rejected. And that's exactly what will happen to the people of Israel. God will bring trouble in their lives until there's nowhere they can find help other than from the one whom they rejected. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of their rejection of Messiah, they will have to pay for it. They will come. And that's why the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, including those who pierced him, including those who rejected him. They will find them in that great tribulation, seven years of suffering, to the point that they will have to look unto God. And the good thing about God is that God will remember his mercy. When the people go down to repentance, God will forgive them and he will restore them and he will heal their land. It's important to understand something about the nation of Israel. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, viewers, we've come to the end of our program today. I want us to pray. But as we pray, you have seen something. That God follows his word to perform it. Even when you run away from God, when you run away in disobedience, God has, a, has set a time when everybody must walk into obedience of that which they have said. If you will not 
Walk in that obedience, then God will force you to obey. Don't wait until you are forced to obey the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and bless you. We give you glory because you are so faithful. Thank you for my listeners this morning. Thank you, God, for everybody whom you have drawn his heart to listen and watch this illustration. May that graphic illustration, Lord, open up your word to them. We thank you, Father. The ultimate thing that we're seeking is to walk in faithful obedience to that which you have said. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Just in case you want us to pray for you because you want to give your life to Jesus, it is so simple. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save, save me today. Make me your friend. Give me a new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. We will continue with the fourth part of our series. We have packaged all this so that you can listen into series and get a clear understanding of all those things. Thank you so much and thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being in the Strong Meat service. The Lord bless you. Thank you for watching our program today. We hope we have been of ministry to you. We would like to help you grow in your walk with God. If you'd like to be part of our online daily Bible study and for prayer requests, please Feel free to contact us on plus 2547332451, plus 2547226571119, plus 2547344339933, plus 2547229817. Email us on Mount Zion Worship Center at gmail.com, our Facebook page, Empty Zion Worship Center. You can also go to Google App Store and download our application to get all this information. We kindly request you to partner with us with your financial support as the Lord leads. Mpesa pay bill number 166998. Account offering or tithe or any other giving. Bank transfer, church bank account, Deliverance Church Mount Zion, account number 025-029-031-9940. Equity Bank Kenya, bank code 068, branch code 025, swift code EQBLKENA. Bank address, Equity Bank, head of S. box 75104, code 00200, Nairobi. God bless you and let us connect again in our program next Sunday at 11. Stay tuned and please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. God bless you.